Hello everybody. This is Professor Johnson. I'm a computer criminologist and I specialize in terms of research and multimedia evidence analysis, which includes images, video, audio, text, and that kind of a thing. A lot of the stuff that you find on the internet. And um, I've been following the, um, the Depp slash Herd case for the last six weeks or so, um, you know, here and there, uh, partly out of professional curiosity. Uh, because I heard that there was a uh, forensic iconographist testifying, um, which was Brian Neumeister, and I, I just did a pretty long video on him. But while I was editing that video, I saw a recommended video from Popcorn Planet uh, talking about Amber Heard's notes and how it appeared that she was faking, pretending to write them. Here's our background right here. People have zoomed in on some shots where the notepad was exposed, and here it is. Mystery solved on TikTok. Uh, you guys have been telling me to watch this one like crazy. What is this she's writing on the paper? Maybe you should touch the paper with your pen. What? Wait, wait. <laughs> wait. She's not writing anything? Now, it sure looks that way to me. I, I'm, it's so bad resolution. It's obviously overblown. Could she be writing something? Maybe? Well, I'm here to tell you, Andy, as someone who is an expert in this field, um, yes, maybe she is. Uh, it's distinctly possible that she's not. It is, she could be pantomiming writing something but the video is not as damning as it appears to be. And I'm actually going to explain why. All right, so for starters, this is gonna be a little bit of a long explanation. I'm gonna try and keep it short and concise. But first, uh, let's talk about the process of forensic iconography. And this is an academic term. It's not one that my uh, fellow practitioners in law enforcement would necessarily use, but it's a term that means studying visual imagery for forensic artifacts. And um, the image itself is going to be evidence, but we're also trying to establish what is known as authenticity. So is it an image forgery and its provenance? So where did the image come from and what was its journey from where, when it was originally captured to when it arrives at the investigator? And in order to do that, we can use a series of different batteries of tests, depending on the circumstances surrounding the investigation, in order to make these determinations. We'll use things like basic image enhancements, image format analysis, and advanced techniques, but also observation, and observation may rely on scientific um, uh, applications of different technologies, tools, techniques, or equipment, or it may be rank observation with our eyes. Now, this is an example of a case where rank observation with our eyes tells us that she's pantomiming writing, but only if we don't really understand exactly what it is we're looking at. So I'm not going to get too technical in this one. I'm going to try and keep it short. Uh, but suffice to say, that's our background. That's forensic iconography. That's what I do. This is my research area. What this comes down to is a problem with idiosyncrasies with lossy formats. So what a lossy format is, and I'm not going to read you this slide because <laughs> it's long, but suffice to say that what a lossy format means is that it can be compressed. And when it's compressed, it undergoes one of a two main types of compression. And what lossy means is that when it's compressed, some of the visual image data is lost as well. This introduces what are known as artifacts or errors. So JPEGs are a very popular image type and they are a lossy format. And when you save a JPEG too much, it creates JPEG artifacts, which are, well, I can show you. So here we have two visually similar images, right? And we need to make a distinction here between forensically identical and visually identical. These two images are visually identical. They are not forensically identical. And why? Because the image on the left is 100% uh, no loss. This is a camera original 
uh, image as it came off the camera, it has suffered no loss whatsoever. On the right hand side is that same image that has been compressed. And while they are visually identical, that compression means that some data is actually lost in the image on the right hand side. We just can't tell with our eyes, which is one of the reasons why JPEGs are such a popular image format because they could be compressed and their file size reduced without losing too much in terms of their visual apparentness, their, their visual uh, representation uh, of the image that's being, being portrayed. But at a lower level, if we were to look a little bit closer, over here on the left-hand side, here is our, our perfect image, and on the right-hand side still is our compressed image. You'll note that when we begin, we have a lot more subtlety. So when uh, lossy formats are compressed, usually it's done in blocks of pixels. And in JPEGs, we're talking 8x8 eight eight pixel matrices. And those 8x8 eight by eight, eight by eight pixel matrices will use a quantization tables and their value in the compression process in order to essentially simplify the image when it is saved. It undergoes that compression. So on the left-hand side, you can see in the upper left-hand corner, we have that matrix, and there's a lot of subtlety in the image. And in the right-hand side, uh, those values have been simplified and truncated so that we have much less subtlety. You can see that there is a difference if we zoom in, there's you know less, uh, less difference between the different shades of gray. And when we're talking about color image, this is the same, the, 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 the same factor. Uh, uh, compression occurs along two different vectors, chrominance and luminance. And when it comes to uh, black and white images such as this, there's really going to be, it's, luminance is going to play more of a factor than chrominance because it's black and white, there's no, there's no color. If we zoom in on the image itself, you can see how this simplification process with the when when these images undergo compression can lead to these errors. On the left hand side, we can see individual pixels, the color of individ, individual pixels, I should say. On the right hand side, uh, we can still see individual pixels, but we can also see that around the complex area of the image, uh, we have haloing, right? These are JPEG artifacts. And normally this is not noticeable to the naked eye, but if we uh, reduce the, uh, if we compress an image to an extreme degree like this, then we can begin to see things are missing, right? So on the left hand side is our camera original image. On the right hand side is one that has been compressed about 90%. So about 10% of the, the uh, original visual image data is present. And we can see it leads to eventually a degradation in that process, right? So on the left-hand side, we have a lot of subtlety in the color and shading on the right-hand side. That's more or less gone. We're just kind of getting the gist of the image and the colors are, well, we're down to uh, probably 256 colors here, right? Now for images, this is what that looks like, but that can happen to videos too, because videos are going to be in lossy or lossless formats as well. And on the internet, most file types are going to be lossy because that is what works better for that medium. When you need to compress an image in order to have it load quickly on a web page or, or through an app or something, um, it's an advantage to have it be lossy because you can compress it and reduce its file size. With lossless images, you can compress them, but they need to be decompressed. And when they're decompressed, they're back to their original file size. They have lost nothing. And video can have errors in it as well. They can have artifacts in it as well. Only since it's a video, it can also do some really strange hinky things with our eyes in the process, such as what happens here. So uh, not that long ago, post-Russian invasion of Ukraine, this video was posted as proof that um, Mr. Putin was producing propaganda, showing that he was attending uh, events or, or some such, when in reality this was a CGI and he was hiding in a bunker somewhere. His hand appears to go through the microphone stand if you watch long enough. But this is not the case. This is an example of what happens to video when it's compressed and it leads to weird artifacts where the uh, computer, when, it, when, it, when it's displaying the image, um, because it's missing so much data, tries to fill in the gaps. And it's just like the image we saw last, it's kind of an approximation of what the original image data was. And so we kind of end up with these weird visual um, errors. Um, 
And this can also happen uh, sometimes also just due to uh, camera angle as well, like the apparent, um, uh, in this case, it looks like President Biden is doing the exact same thing with this microphone where he kind of uh, goes right through it. This was, again, used uh, as proof that this is some kind of propaganda that in reality he's a CGI lizard person or something like that. Um, but again, this is compressed way down to be broadcast over the internet. Um, and so it plays tricks on our eyes in that case because we're not really getting the full picture we're losing a lot of the subtlety in the original image and in this case perspective plays a major role as well because these cameras are in our field of view they appear to be in the foreground when in reality these um, these things these are called dead cats on the end of microphones uh, in order to avoid um, annoyance with the wind blowing through them uh, are actually on sticks and they are low and they are very close up in the same range in the field of view as our subject and in this case president biden's hand was not going through the microphone it's just a trick of vision which is aided uh by the horrible compression um to making it seem as if his hand went through it when in reality it's very clearly quite some way behind him So I hope that that clears things up a little bit. It is entirely possible, again, that Amber Heard in this case is pantomiming writing. However, it's my professional opinion. <laughs> this is not an official professional opinion. I'm not actually offering one here. I, I shouldn't joke about that because this is actually serious. I'm just speculating on what might be happening given the information that I have available to me. So it is possible that Amber Heard is pantomiming writing in this case. But I believe, based on my experience and what I'm seeing here, that what we're more likely looking at is just an example of a video which was posted to social media which was taken from social media which is then well so this was originally hold on let me retrace our steps here so this is video that was originally captured by courtroom cameras i assume this wasn't taken with somebody's cell phone in the courtroom because that would be highly inappropriate so captured by cameras in the courtroom which were live streamed to the internet which somebody captured used in a video on tiktok and then that tiktok video was taken on YouTube, on Popcorn Planet, and then streamed to me, to my monitor, and now I'm looking at it this way. If you think about it in those terms, like this video has changed through so many hands, it's undergone compression multiple times along the way, um, it's just way more likely that what we're looking at here is just the result of lossy compression, and we're just not getting the even a close picture to what was originally represented uh, in real life here on the camera in the court. All right, I hope that clears things up. Thanks.